chapter 6 now in the Sermon on the Mount. We're starting a new section that will cover verses 1 through 18. 1 to 18. And normally when I start a new section, we read the whole thing together to get our bearing. I'm not going to do that today. I want you to focus just on the very first verse. As a matter of fact, we're not going to get past the first half of the first verse today. Because we've got to set our tone. That's as far as we're going. Let me read this for you here. Looking at Matthew chapter 6. Be careful then not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will not have a reward from your Father in heaven. I want you to look at just that first part of that first sentence. Seeing that again, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. Uh, with each section, I try to set a, a theme, let you know what the theme, what the focus that Jesus is going to have as he's speaking here. And this section has a theme, and I want you to look at that first verse, that first half of first verse, that first sentence there, and I want you to be thinking, I don't want you to answer right now, but if you had to pick a theme for this section based on those that first sentence, what would it be for this section? What is Jesus going to focus on? What is the issue at hand here that he wants to instruct his listeners about? Now, as I looked at this, I got to dig through a number of commentaries and a number of uh, different uh, pastors uh, teaching on this, and there was a, a lot of different ideas, but a couple that seemed to be very the dominant. I'm going to share those with you and let you know where they went with this, but some said this. Uh, a number of churches, especially more liberal churches, pastors said this about the passage. Right here you can find very clearly that what Jesus tells you is that this militant Christianity that so many conservatives, so many fundamentalists want to do is really not in view. What Jesus is saying here is that our faith is a very private thing between us and God. It's not something that's to be pushed in people's faces. It's not something you shouldn't see people down at the parks bothering people and sharing the gospel with them, handing out tracts. This is a, this is a faith that is between you and God. This is a personal thing where God speaks to your heart, where God transforms you, but it's not something that you should be pushing out there into the world at large. Now, that's one take on this. Wrong. <coughs> You're not going to go with that one? Okay. <laughs> Here's the second one. And they would say this, that the theme of the passage is humility. Now, what we're looking at here, the humility, is that you should try to see to it the things you do for Christ, the ministries you undertake, are as clandestine as possible. You don't want people noticing the kinds of things you do. And if you're going to help someone, you should try to keep it as few people knowing it as possible. If you're going to do works of service, you should never try to draw attention to anything that you're doing for Christ because the key is that you are supposed to be just doing this without any concern for being recognized at all. As a matter of fact, you'd prefer that no one ever knew the things you do for God in the church because there's a worry that you're going to get proud of those actions. Now that's number two. I'll tell you, I'm not going to use either one of those this morning. So keep thinking of what you think the theme might be, because I'll, I'll, I'll give this away. Neither one of those fits our passage. Now first off, in the very context of our sermon, you might remember Jesus talking about us being two things in the world. Remember what those were? Salt, Salt and light. Now, how unnoticeable is light in a dark place? <laughs> very private. It's very private, very clandestine, it's very laid back. Uh, salt, you put it in the corruption of a wound and rub it in there. How unnoticeable is that to the individual? Yeah, that might be an issue. Such an answer. To retard corruption, to put salt in a corrupting world, to put light in a dark place is hardly unnoticeable. It certainly doesn't spit with this whole idea that our faith is to be quiet, unobserved, and unknown in the world. Peter talked about this a little bit. This is in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. And Peter says this, Live such good lives among the pagans. Here's a nice, nice way to make your people around you love you. Let them know that <laughs> the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now, what is Peter after here? What's his goal for us? A testimony that is so undeniable, that is so obvious before a watching world, that even your enemies know that if they're trying to accuse you of something, 
they know they're lying and anybody watching them knows they're lying. Does that sound clandestine? Does that sound like your faith is to be something, even the practice of your faith in regards to other believers and the service you do, is it something that should not be observed before a watching world? What did Jesus say would be the greatest testimony we have? How would people know that we are different than the rest of the world, that our type of faith is different, that our character is different? What was the great test, he said, when the world looks at you, how will they know you're my followers? What's that? Love for one another. And how do you see that lived out? Clandestinely? Quietly? You know, I got to check. I have no idea who was taking care of me. You know, we know they have to see this. These are visible things. So what is Jesus after here? Let's come back to that. Here's your question now. It's not humility. Is humility important for a believer? Yes. And it was established. We did that in the very opening, the Beatitudes. We found out the very life in Christ begins in what attitude? Humility before God. That's not what's in view here. Clearly, there is no command in Scripture that says your faith should be stealth. You are Batman. No one should ever know your identity. You do marvelous things, but they never know it's you. That's not in here. What is Jesus after? What is he saying here with this command? Don't do your acts of righteousness to be seen by men. <clears throat> they don't want you to put it on display where you go around oh, counting to everybody what you've done or making a big scene when you're doing something. Okay, we're on track here. So if we're going to look at a theme, give me a word or a sentence or a brief description. What's his theme then? Yes. Correct intentions. Okay, correct intentions. That's getting there. Hypocrisy. What is the purpose of your heart? What is the purpose of your heart? I went with your one word, hypocrisy. Jesus is focusing on the issue here of hypocrisy. It's an interesting Greek word. Hypocrites in the Greek. Is, uh, I hope I pronounced that right. George, don't tell me. <laughs> the original meaning from classical Greek is this. It refers to an actor on a stage. No offense, you <laughs> An actor or actress on a stage. It means to assume a role, to play a part that has nothing to do with who you really are. Now, we'll start with that. I'll, I'll let you know that don't we appreciate good actors who can pull that off and entertain us? I mean, the greatest of actors are actors who can play more than one role. Now, there are certain people I like. John Wayne was the best John Wayne there ever was. <laughs> and he could play John Wayne better than anybody ever played John Wayne. But he was always, whether he was a cowboy or a soldier, he was John, John Wayne. Wayne. <laughs> But are there some actors and actresses that can take almost any role and morph themselves into it? I was stunned. I was blown away. I watched The Darkest Hour, Gary Oldman playing Winston Churchill. And I have to tell you that I was immersed. I, I felt I was watching Winston Churchill on, on the screen. There are, there are people that are quite impressive with their ability to do that. The problem here that we're looking at is that Jesus is concerned not with something who is acting for a part, and we all know we're watching entertainment. He is a concern with an actor who makes the world a stage. That's the old saying, is it all the world is a stage and we are but actors upon it? That's not his philosophy. He's after something else here. He's concerned with those who assume a role. Now, I'm going to warn you, the word hypocrisy is not in the text. So how did I get here to this idea of saying it's his hypocrisy? He doesn't even use the Greek word your, in the text. Your righteousness. Okay, your righteousness. Mm -hmm. There's another word there. Look at this. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen. seen. This is a critical word. Very critical word. It's theomai. It's, from the, it's a word in the Greek from which we get the word theater. Hmm. He's speaking of a piece of theater. And what do we mean? We've, we've gone and we've seen a piece of theater. A performance. It's an acting moment. It's this moment of performance. The war warning here is to avoid theater. 
understand this. Jesus is not saying that our acts, that our actions should not be seen by men. His command is that our acts, that our actions should not be an act performed before men. He is much more concerned, not that you don't get noticed, but that you are not making yourself noticed for something that is not real, that is not honest. It is not an act. And isn't that the oldest game in the book? Let's, let's, let's go back to this. He's dealing here with Jewish hypocrisy. He's dealing with what the religion of the day. But is that an uncommon thing for humanity in all honesty? The pretense? Where else do you see it? Is it the oldest game in the book to try to pretend to look like something and be something you're not? How about those stories we tell from high school and college days, guys? All true. All true. <laughs> Every version they've ever heard of that same story. They were all true. Except for the bad things. I agree, Tim. Isn't that amazing? Yes, those three touchdowns in high school will be six by the time you're 40. They'll be something else. It's an amazing moment that you find that, that people do this. We tell stories. We build an image. We put it out there. Our world is rife with it. I, one of the worst, least favorite things my wife has is to go with me shopping for a car. <laughs> she hates shopping for cars with me. I know it's a game, and I'm ready to play it when I walk in to the showroom. It's not fun. <laughs> I'll go with you. There's almost a week between me and the sales as you go, let's start this. We know we're both playing. Let's see how this goes. Because I think I'm a better actor than you. And I'm going to win. And there's a game. And you know it's a game. I especially love it where he immediately wants to side up with you. And he's the guy, I'm fighting for you. I want you to get that car at that price. And I'm going to go into my sales manager. And I'm going to fight like crazy to get you the deal that you want. And you know the second he goes in there, whose side is he on? His pocket. You betcha, because the price needs to stay up because he's on a commission. And you know he is, and he knows you know he is. And I love the games we play. I especially like going to the dealership that has the car sitting there with the base price, but they've already added several things I don't want. And their whole thing is, here's the price. But you know, well, that's not really the problem. Well, what is the real price? Well, it's $6,000 because we put blow jack on it. We have etching on the windows, so if anybody steals this car and strips it all out, we can find this stuff. And we can. I don't want that stuff. Take it off. We can't take it off. Then don't charge me for it. I didn't ask you to put it on. And that's the game we get to play. <laughs> There's a falseness to this. There's a gamesmanship as we talk about this. Every business out there hires people to create an image that may have nothing to do with what the company is really like. Right now, it's very important to be green. Your company has to appear to love the planet, to be adoring the planet. You have to see that. But the image that we built, I remember years ago, the Maytag company built a whole image around the Maytag salesman. Who was, you might remember, the loneliest guy in the world. Why? Because they never broke down. This was a product that just never broke down. I, they had a buildup, a whole series of these commercials that we worked through, and the guys always sitting there with a the cobweb-covered phone, <laughs> hoping for the big moment. I remember they finally had one breakthrough in the commercial series where the guy got to go to the house to find out the product wasn't plugged in. <laughs> this is the game we play. We, we want to project and create an image. Politics has become the biggest part about that right now. If you go through history, Lincoln Douglas, when they were going back and forth and running for president, the debates were a minimum of four hours. The format was the opening person gave at least an hour. There was then a two-hour rebuttal by the other guy, which was followed by another hour by the guy who led the whole thing off. And they went back and forth as to who led and who got to have first and last word on these things. And often then it would be followed by a direct question and answer between the two guys that can last another couple of hours. Now, can you imagine American voters <laughs> caring enough to sit through four to six hours to determine which candidate really has the better vision for the future? 
It was a combat of ideas, a competition of ideas. Our modern, the our modern politics is a competition of image. It's sound bites. It's to create a guy that you like and that you feel is closer to you. It image be, making it is what we do. Fifteen seconds nowadays. Yeah. I, I just love the format. I'm going to ask you this critical question that's going to shape the future of the country. And you have a 30 second time slot to tell me this vision that's going to shape and perhaps affect my grandchildren and my grandchildren's grandchildren. Really? That's where we live. Now keeping in mind here, what Jesus is confronting is a religion of its day that had become excellent at being an image, projecting an image. He is confronting this lie of hypocrisy that tried to create a certain view of what they were like. And if you remember, we started with this, because right from the beginning, he goes, the character is the issue. He's built that, he goes with the Beatitudes, he goes, well, you've missed it. There's, there's an issue of what you are is really at the heart of this. And then the last few weeks, or a few weeks, that's been a lot longer than a few weeks as I did the, the six contrasts between what they taught and what God had really said. He said, because your character is wrong, you approach the Bible wrong, you're not getting the teaching right. And if your character is wrong and your teaching is not right, how do you think your religious practices daily are going to turn out? And now he comes to that. Because of what you are and because of what you've twisted the teaching to say, here is the complete vacancy of the way you worship. And this is what he's going to go after here. God condemns hypocrisy. I want to tell you this. This is from Amos, book of Amos. And Amos is an interesting book in the Old Testament. But this is the prophet Amos. This is chapter 5. I want you to look at verse 21 here. Amos chapter 5 and verse 21. If you don't get there, you can just follow along here. He's, Jesus God speaking to his people. He says, I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I won't accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Here's the end. I want you to understand something. Here is God condemning Israel for observing the feast he gave them. Here is God condemning Israel for condemning the sacrifices he demands of them. Here is God condemning Israel for the style of worship he told them to do, the songs they were supposed to sing, the days they were supposed to do it, and he says it's nothing. Now, if they're doing what God said, how can he be angry? How they're doing there's an hypocrisy in it he goes through and starts talking about but let justice roll like a river righteousness like a never fail, failing stream did you bring me sacrifices and offering 40 years in the desert O house of israel you have lifted up the shrine of your king the pedestal of your idols he goes you're not connected to me at all in these practices you're doing a lot of noise and a lot of things, and there's no content to it. No relationship. There's no relationship between the two of us. You're not talking to me. You're putting on a show. Now, I'm going to ask you, you don't have to tell me, have you ever been to a church where you felt that immediately? Yes. Mm -hmm. Where you could tell it was a show? Uh, our speaker, Mr. Washer, yesterday uh, mm -hmm. hit me with something that I, I had noticed before, and I, he was really emphatic about it. And he said, here's what bothers me in prayer when churches pray. He goes, the guy comes up there and goes, welcome. I'm so glad to see you all here this morning. And great to be at Faith Community Church. We're just so glad you're here. Oh, Tim, good to see you again. How have you both been? This is great. Oh, look, he's our young men up front. This is so great and marvelous. All of you. I'll tell you what we're going to do. Let's stop and pray for God right now. Let's stop and pray for God just a moment. And Lord, and he, go, and he goes, it's a show. He's not stopping to pray for God. The prayer is part of this whole dynamic of trying to get everybody excited that we're here, trying to be entertaining and hold on to them. He says there is no sense of entering the presence of a holy God and the humility that should be part of that moment when you pray. And I, I never stopped and thought about it, but he's right. There's this sense that people just 
make this whole and have you heard the people that roll into a prayer and it's a completely different person and voice than they are in real life <laughs> and it becomes a whole presentation for some pastors it's a whole other sermon God is wanting something different here the book of Job is about hypocrisy that's the whole theme this is what the devil accuses Job of being hypocrite he looks at God and says, you think this is your sermon? You think this show is real? Tell you what, if you take away all of the blessings you gave him, I'll show you what a hypocrite Job is. That's the basis of the book. And if you go to Job, just to give you some reference here, you get an idea of how God views his hypocrisy and how God is making a point that his your sermon is the real deal. Job 15, 34 says, For the congregation of the hypocrites shall be desolate. You can get a lot of people together worshiping, but it means nothing. It's going to be desolate. Job 8, 13. The hypocrites' hope will perish. Job 27, 8. For what is the hope of the hypocrite when God takes away his soul? That's pretty harsh. Job 36, 13, for the hypocrites in heart shall heap up wrath. <clears throat> Hypocrisy is seen in a very low way by God. Jesus is taking up a theme that has run right through Scripture. And Jesus isn't going to let this theme go. He's introducing it here in his first sermon. Did you remember some other places where Jesus sort of has a few things to say about hypocrisy? Oh, yeah, there's that one. Your whitewashed sepulcher. What is a sepulcher? It's a tomb. It's a grave. Covered over whitewash. Yeah, you put, well, it looks pretty. Well, you don't put some pictures on here. And, no, it's what's inside is still dead. Yeah. Well, and it was made by the stuff to keep the stones together. It was made with with uh, manure. It was stuck together by manure, so it's whitewashed. Well, that was the whitewashed Carp. wall. <laughs> that was Paul's favorite. You are a whitewashed wall. And as I've told you in the past, when the farmers would make these small walls that divide up for the chickens and the sheep and whatever, you would scrape up mud, stone, debris, whatever you could find. But also what was always in the farmyard when you... Manure. 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 And you would then pile it all together. And if you've ever piled that stuff up, you know it stinks. And you know it won't hold together, so they would cover it with a lime whitewash so that it would keep the moisture down and the smell under control. So Paul is saying a rather harsh comment when he says that your, your integrity is like these whitewashed walls out here in the farmyards. It's a rough one. Uh, another one that's used is an overgrown grave. And he says this is a mound of dirt, and now there's grass growing on it, maybe there's flowers coming out of it, but it's still a grave. Jesus was real rough on them. This is from chapter 27, I believe, in Matthew. No, we get 23. We'll get to 27. Matthew chapter 23. And Jesus, who was very gentle with the Pharisees, <laughs> easygoing guy, kind of laid back, a non-confrontational kind of guy in his whole life. This is in verse 13. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. One of my personal favorites. Can you imagine? confronting the most revered leaders in Israel and saying when you're done with one of your converts he's twice the son of hell that you are hypocrisy has a rather strong term in this whole thing as I said in Luke he calls them overgrown graves in Acts Paul refers to Israel as a whitewashed wall Peter in 2nd Peter 2 17 refers to the hypocrites as a as a, as a dry well now, I want you to get the full power of what he's talking about. Let's understand this was a largely desert community. And traveling over areas, there were places where wells were dug. And the well was critical. 
because there were only so many places water was available. You might travel over this arid land, and everybody knew where these wells were. The destruction of a well, the fouling of a well, could be a death sentence to you, because it would mean death to people coming to this. Now imagine, you know where this well is. It's been a well there for 200 years, and you all show up, and you've used every drop of water you had, and you take the cover off. They were often covered to keep the sand and dirt out and find out it's empty. And this is what Peter says. The leaders of Israel are like coming up. You're coming here for the water of life, and you open up the well, and it's just a hole. It's just a pit, a shaft dug into the ground. It's nothing. The lack of character that Jesus addresses here is very real. In the time of Jesus, it had become a practiced image that was refined to an art form. This is what I want you to understand what he's confronting here. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the, the rabbis and different leaders had refined the art of worship to a fine, it was just beautifully done. They could assume a role like no one could. For instance, they made sure they had special mourning clothes. And I'm not talking about mourning as in the morning of the day. I'm talking about you mourning over something. And when they would talk about their sin, they would come out and throw ashes up there, put on sackcloth, and then they would take and rend their clothing, wailing about their pain. Well, they wanted to make sure they could reuse this the next time they needed to put on a performance. So they made very weak seams so that when you tore these things, it could be easily sewn back up and the fabric wouldn't be damaged. They had decided they needed to promote uh, people to give, and so they had a whole ceremony where horns and trumpets would be sounded, and the person would come forward and announce the amount of money they're giving to the poor in the temple. And they had this whole thing. They had makeup for fasting. Okay, I want you to understand. The makeup was designed to make your face look gray and ashen, so it looked like you had been fasting a lot longer than you really had. And the whole thing was to build an image, to put together this, this false narrative of what kind of a super spiritual person you were. And this is what Jesus is confronting here. Understand how ingrained in the culture it was. I don't want you to think it was just, it became a problem in the early church. You've probably heard the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Now, I want you to understand that when they came forward and made that claim, we sold this piece of land and we're offering the money for God, this was not unusual. It was the standard practice of the day. It was what they grew up with. It's what they knew was done. This is how you gave money. And they also understood that the more it looked like you were giving, the better you looked. So if you didn't want to let anybody know, they kept back some of the sale price. Now, first off, selling the price, was that a problem, selling their property? Was giving it to the church a problem? Was keeping some of the proceeds from this for themselves a problem? What was the issue? Lying. Lying before God. But hypocrisy was so ingrained to them, they didn't see a problem. They didn't feel any fear. They didn't see why God would react. He never had before. They'd watched the Pharisees and the rabbis do it for years. This was a shock to them. It was a shock to the watching audience when God struck them dead. They had not seen anything like this before. Jesus here is giving an advice, a warning, that hypocrisy will be found out. This is very important to understand this. There are people we seem to see in life that get away with a lot of things, but God is going after his own, those who claim to be his, and he's saying this, they, the truth will come out. God does not want you to get away with living there for a time. There's an old story. Uh, you're familiar with Aesop's fables? I like Aesop's fables. I get a kick out of those. There's a story in there of a wolf that wanted to eat a sheep. And the wolf was watching the very vigilant shepherd who never gave an opening to get near the sheep. So he decided there was a way to do it. You know what he did? He found himself an old sheepskin and wrapped himself in it and went down among the sheep to wait till night when the shepherd would go to bed and he could have himself a meal. And so he hung out there. 
The problem was on this particular night, the shepherd decided that he also wanted a meal and he figured I'd slaughter one of the sheep. <laughs> Looking out among his flock, he saw a very large sheep, the biggest sheep he had ever seen, and decided this would feed him for days and thus had himself a meal of the wolf. Hypocrisy will be found out. And God is warning his people here, the context and what he's going to go after in this section is to make sure we understand that. He's not going to leave it alone. What Jesus is contrasting here are the true standards. He wants us to get and understand what is really happening here. As I said, Jesus tells them they have had to have a change in nature. They needed to have a change in their teaching. And now they have to have a change in their worship because their hearts went wrong. And I would warn you that the Jews really didn't consider what they were doing to be wrong. They didn't see it as hypocrisy. And I want you to think of why they wouldn't see it as hypocrisy. Because it comes down to this. What are most religions in the world based on? What's the practice of, what is the style of practice of almost all the world's religion? It's down to works. It's what I do. And the better I do it, the better off I'm going to be before God, right? Before their God before the God they're talking about, yes? And that's what we're talking about. I want you to think about this. In the Muslim faith, we see this whole thing surrounding the very radicalized side of it that talks about additional reward from God if you do certain things. And to die a martyr killing pagans is seen as a step up. They do not see any hypocrisy in this, in murder, they don't see any problem with it, no matter who they murder, because it is what you do. It is not about what you are. It is not about what you think or what you're trying to accomplish before God. It is all about doing what's on the list, getting the list done. This is why you find some of the inconsistency, and I, I know the recording, but we'll deal with that. Uh, we look at the Catholic Church. Is it, have you ever been amazed by some of the people who consider themselves good Catholics and what they do for a living? It was always an oddity that some people could be involved in organized crime and yet still be a good Catholic. Because to them, as long as you did the certain requirements of the faith, as long as you went before the priest and did your confession, you could go back and do it again because I'll just come back and get it absolved because it always comes down to this, religion is about what you do. Jesus is confronting the most basic of human aspects. And he's going to go after this in our section. He's going to go after the Pharisees. And if you recall, back in chapter 5, he said this. Your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. It's got to be better than theirs. And now we're going to see that contrast. And he's going to do this contrast by showing the distinction of what God wants and what he's getting from Israel in three areas in our text. We're going to see it in praying, we're going to see it in giving, and we're going to see it in fasting. Because I want to tell you, there were three things the Pharisees were really, really good at. You know what they were good at? Praying, giving, and fasting. They were superb at the show. Prayers, there are literally records of how they would sit down and draft out their prayers to see to it that it was the most beautiful piece of oratory when they delivered it possible. It was laid out to perfection. It had to be a great performance. Told you what they did for fasting, how they would have the makeup on them, make them look grayish and pale. Uh, the giving, as we said, was always to put on a big show about oh, how much I'm sacrificing for God. And look what I'm doing. And Jesus is going to come back to this. Now, if you have a King James there, the opening, I want to correct something. It says, be careful then, doing your acts of righteousness. Now, does anybody have a King James? Are they reading the King James here? Because the King James will say, yeah, alms. Does it say alms there? I don't know. King James says, yes, it's Okay. The King James does alms. It focuses on only one aspect of what Jesus is after here, the giving of alms or giving of money. This is a much broader than that. The acts of righteousness is the better translation. And also notice how he starts this. Be careful or beware. 
You understand this? Now, why does Jesus start with this? This is a judgment aspect. He's warning them of coming judgment. He's talking about what they think they're doing and the result they're going to get. He's saying, be very careful before God because this can be costly. He's also saying, beware, because he wants you to stop and think about how things are being done. Be careful. What is really going on here? What is the practice? What are they really after? What are you really after? What is the church doing week by week in terms of its service? Is it honestly service or is it a show? And he's telling you, you need to stop because man's human nature, the sin nature, accepts these acts of hypocrisy as normal. And it's going to take someone who understands what God really wants, what God is really saying, to distinguish between when an act is really honoring to God and when it's a show. And we talked about this before. Who do we lie to better than anybody else in our world? Ourselves. Ourselves. We want to believe the best about us. Because we know we are the best. And that is the attitude we bring to this, and that's the concern they have. Even if we aren't, we feel better if we think other people think we're the best. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to understand why he picks these three things. Not only was it because the Pharisees were good at it, but try this. Giving is what shows our action and attitude towards others. Prayer shows our attitude and actions toward God. And fasting is where we do an honest assessment of our attitude and our relationship with ourself. Each of these deals with the three things we need to understand. How do we view our fellow man? How do we view our God? And how are we viewing ourselves? This is what he's going to be after here in these 18 verses. This is where we're going to go. I have a shorter one today because I didn't want to try to delve into this uh, because I know I wouldn't get very far once I actually got to the outline. So starting the outline for five or ten minutes doesn't make a lot of sense to me today. This is as far as we're going to go in this whole thing. Understand this. He's contrasting two things. As we said, people look at this and say, well, you know, it, it's... It's talking about humility. No, it's talking about that you should not share your faith. This is what A.A. Bruce said. We are to show when tempted to hide. And we are to hide when we are tempted to show. And that's what he's talking about here is finding a balance between the two. When is it time to let something be seen? When is it time not to? And it all comes down to an assessment of the character behind it and the intent. Let's close that.